book of Luke, chapter 16, verse 10, the Bible says, in verse 10, uh, chapter 16, the book of Luke, the Bible says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore we have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Heavenly Father, Lord, I come now to you and ask, Father God, for your blessings, uh, for your word. I know you promise, Father God, that you're going to bless your word, and your word will not return to you void. Heavenly Father, I ask the empowering of the Holy Spirit, Lord, be upon me as I've prayed uh, privately, Lord, and ask publicly that, Lord God, you empower me and that the Holy Spirit will, uh, will uh, be the one to intervene. And Heavenly Father, I know words cannot express. Lord, my words uh, could not do it, but I believe the Holy Ghost can bring the conviction, the change, and conversion in this house. Holy Spirit of God, I ask now, uh, empower the listening ability of these folks that they will understand. Give us understanding and teach us, Father. Preach to me and through me, I pray. And I seek to, uh, uh, to praise and I seek to exalt the name of Jesus in the message and after the message and what you're going to do, Father, in this uh, uh, worship. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated, please. Happy Family Sunday to each and every one of you. I know this is a Family Sunday. And uh, family Sunday is always good. You make plans and you plan out for the family and plan out where to go after this. Tomorrow is a holiday. Most of you are not going to work tomorrow. Staff, it's a holiday too. Okay, praise the Lord. No work tomorrow. So um, I know you've got some plans. Um, but today, although it's a family Sunday, our lessons give more towards uh, uh, other things. But we could be able to channel that to the family as well. There are only two school of thoughts in this world. There's only two. One is man's way, and the other is God's way. Man's way and God's way. But check out, the book of Isaiah says, As far as the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And then my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You see, God says, I have some other ways. You have your own way. So in this world, there's only two school of thought, man's way or God's way. And we can apply this in all aspects of our lives. You can, you can, uh, you can uh, 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 apply this in marriage. You can apply this in ministry. Uh, you can apply this in, uh, in morality. You can apply this in money, which is our topic today. Nobody's excited about it. <laughs> By the way, February, is the, February month is emphasizing on finances and uh, emphasizes on giving and supporting missionaries. That's, the, that's, the, uh, that's a drive for the month of February. I know it's a love month. I know that most of you are looking forward for February 14. Most of you are looking forward to get out there on Friday, couples retreat. Amen. Most of you booked already. There's 14 who book. Uh, a hotel room, February 14, and there's 32 couples who are attending this weekend. Praise the Lord for that. And if you haven't booked yet, man, hey, you elbow your spouse on the side. Yeah, book me. Come on. All right. Anyways, let's go back here. This lesson could help you in your family as well. All right. Uh, talking about finances, there's so many things that uh, we can talk about, uh, but the emphasis today is with regards to being a faithful steward, being a faithful steward. I, I appreciate the young man who came here and sing that song, uh, faithful men, you know, men. We need men. We need men today who would stand up. Who, we need men today who would stand up and take the challenge. We need men today who will lead the family. We need men today who, are, uh, who would not give up but lead on their families, you see. I was reminded of a story about a father giving $2 to his daughter. He said to his young daughter, four-year-old, all right, uh, you can do anything you want with one dollar, but the dollar, the other dollar, give it to the Lord. And so the young child was so happy. 
So she, she ran to the candy store. And running to the candy store, she tripped. And one dollar, you know, dropped and went into the storm drain. <laughs> she got up and said, well, Lord, that's your dollar. <laughs> <laughs> well, today we're going to teach you, hopefully, I would like to encourage you not to lose God's dollar. All right, not to lose God's dollar. Uh, consider the following statements of the wealthiest people of their day and recognize that wealth is not what the world perceives it to be. Listen to these millionaires and billionaires at the end of their day. This is what they said. W.H. Vanderbilt said, the care of $200 million is enough to kill anyone. There is no pleasure in it. John Jacob Astor, one of the millionaires here in the Northwest, said, I am the most miserable man on earth. John D. Rockefeller, one of the millionaires, too, he said, I have made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. Andrew Carnegie, a millionaire, said, Millionaires seldom smile. Henry Ford, the maker and founder of the cars that you drive, he said, I was happier when I, when I was doing a mechanic's job. You see, people perceive that when you have there, when you have the millions and you have all these gizmos and all these things in this world, you will be happy, but not so. In the Bible, there are three cons considerations to help us understand the roles of a steward. We as a steward of what God has given to us. We have to recognize that God has given us some roles. And the first one here is being number one in your outline, the purpose of a steward. What is the purpose? What's your purpose? Why are we here? Why did God so bless us so much with these material things? Uh, last Sunday, I, I don't know who, but somebody preached that, you know, if you earn $20,000 a year, you're in the top 2%, is that right? 10%. Wow. And I believe most of us are up there. If you earn $20,000 a year, you're rich, guys. The purpose of a steward. What's a steward? By definition, a steward is a house distributor. It's a ma he's a manager. He's an overseer. He's a fiscal agent or a treasurer. Okay? And that's a steward. You are a steward of God, what God has entrusted to you. Letter A in that outline, the purpose of a steward. Letter A, the steward is to manage the owner's resources. We are here to manage the resources God has given to us. And number one, we have to realize that we are not the owners. We are not the owners of what God has given to us. First Chronicles 29 verse 14, the Bible says, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sword? David was saying and praying to God, who am I? Lord God, we're but nothing. And then he said, for all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. Essentially, David was saying, all the things that we have, God, you have given it to us. We're just returning it to you. You see, David was wise enough to realize that all things, all his riches, all his abilities was given by God. He was not the owner, but God is the owner. Psalms 24 verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Folks, the psalmist also, and that's David, he realized that all these things in this world doesn't belong to him. It belongs to God. All these things that we see in this world don't belong to us. First, it will, uh, folks, it will do us good if we realize that we're not the owners of what we have. We are used to saying, hey, my car, my house, my shirt, mine, mine. We are used to saying that. But folks, realize this. In the deeper scheme of things, in the economy of God, we are not really the owners. We are stewards. Let me just drive it to you. We are stewards of what God has given to us. We are not the owners. In fact, even your bodies, if you're saved, it doesn't belong to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirits, which are God's. You see, we do not belong to ourselves. Our bodies do not belong to our own. 
Therefore, you don't have right to put anything in your body that would destroy the body, isn't it? You get drunk. What happens when you get drunk? You know, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. You're drunk with wine. You got no right to feed that body with liquor. Uh, folks, you, you intoxicate yourself with pornography. You intoxicate yourself with, uh, with, with drugs or marijuana or anything else. That's not your body. It doesn't belong to you, folks. By the way, we're so strong preaching about these drugs, preaching about alcohol. Well, if you're a Christian, you smell like a Christian. Don't smell like a person who just came from hell with a smoke. Uh, folks, it doesn't belong to you. The Lord owns you, and He bought you with a price. Mind you this, He bought you with His blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. That's how He paid the price for you. You know, I was told a story of a woman who just came from uh, uh, finished shopping, and so she was going to her car. When she went to her car, she noticed there are four men, four guys inside the car. So she dropped her bag, she dropped her shopping bag, pulled out a handgun and said, I know how to use this one, get out of the car! <laughs> Those guys, they didn't wait for another invitation, they run like crazy, they went out. And so, you know, frazzled and quite confused, the old lady went inside the car and dropped her grocery bags and tried to start the car. She kept on wondering why you keep on starting the car. It won't start, only to realize that her car is four spaces on the right. <laughs> so she took her bags and went to her car and started and went to the closest police station to surrender herself. <laughs> and so while she was there, you know, she was saying, I'm sorry, you know. And, and, and the desk officer was laughing at her. And, and he looked on the other side of the counter, and he was pointing four guys right there in the corner who was reporting they were hijacking, you know, in the mall. And they were saying, that this old woman, you know, not taller than five feet with thick glasses and curly white hair, she pointed a gun at us, and we run. And so they're looking at each other. <laughs> By the way, there were no charges made. Praise the Lord. You see, she thought that the car is hers. Matter of fact, it doesn't belong to her. Uh, that's why I'm leery with people who've got glasses. You know, sometimes my wife, I park in, I, I go pick her up from the sky train, I park right there, and she still went to the other car and tries to open the other car. <laughs> <laughs> well, the same color, black cars, you know. Apparently, girls, they don't know, they, they don't care if it's a Kia or it's a, um, it, it's, a, it's a Dodge. As long as it's black, they're all the same, you know? <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's a BMW, <laughs> Kia, they're all black to me. The fact of the matter is, you know, we don't belong to ourselves. It all belongs to God. We think we own. We think we, this is mine. We think it's my bank account. We think my children, my house. But the fact of the matter is, folks, it all belongs to God. If you realize the number one principle, everything belongs to God, you will be all right. Secondly, I am his manager. He is the owner, but I am his manager. We need to acknowledge that there is a difference between God giving us assets and God entrusting us His assets. So there's a difference. God entrusted us His assets. It's not ours. We must understand our role as stewards of God's assets. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. As the song goes, the young man sang that song a while ago. We are not owners of God's assets, but managers of God's assets. Consider the following statistics from uh, the program called Affluenza. Um, really, it was my first time to, to meet this word Affluenza. I think, uh, you know, I, I thought that was a sickness, you know. <laughs> but anyways, I look it up, and here's the definition of Affluenza. It is a social disease caused by cons consumerism, 
commercialism and rampant materialism, and its antidote is simple living. I'm right. It's a form of sickness. The bad effects of living in a so society where many people are too rich, such as always wanting new, expensive things, or having to work too hard. Uh, just keeping up with the Jonases is what they said. Another definition is this. Affluence is defined as a painful, contagious, socially transmitted condition of overload, uh, debt, anxiety, and waste resulting from the dogged pursuit of more. Another definition is this. Uh, affluence Affluenza has also been used to refer to an inability to understand the consequences of one's actions because of financial privileges. You know, people, they don't care if they wreck the car, they don't care if they, they're driving, spitting, well, my dad will pay for it. You know, my, my mom is rich. Or, uh, they don't care about the consequences. That's affluenza. Don't you know that the average North American shops six hours a week but spends only 40 minutes with his children? I trust that it's not, hap not happening to you. But North Americans, this are the regular trend. They spend hours and hours in shopping, uh, too little time for their children. By age 20, we have seen one million commercials. Right? We've seen one million commercials. More North Americans declared bankruptcy than graduated from college. In 90% of divorce cases, Arguments about money play a prominent role. Finances. Folks, we are the managers. We are not the owner, but we are his managers. The steward is simply to multiply the owner's resources. The steward, secondly, a steward is to manage the owner's resources. And secondly, a steward is to multiply the owner's resources. We are uh, expected to multiply what God has given to us. In the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 14 to 20, for the sake of time, let me relate to you the story here. In the book of Matthew, uh, Jesus Christ was telling a parable, and, and he, he said there was this Lord, there was this master, he's got servants. And before he left for a far country and returned, he gave talents to his servants according to their several abil abilities. One, he gave one talent. To the other, he gave two talents. To the other, he gave five talents. And at his coming back, he required all these servants to report to him. And the guy who's got five talents came to his Lord and said, uh, Lord, you gave me five talents. And by trading and uh, uh, using all these talents, I trade and I gain five more. And the other guy who's got two, he said the same thing. Lord, you gave me two talents. By trading and using the talents you gave me, I gain another two talents. And the Lord, the master of those servants said, commented to these two servants the same thing. He said, well done, the, full, uh, the good and faithful servants. The same commendation he gave because of their several abilities. But the guy who came, wh whom God gave one talent, came to him and said, you know what? Uh, I was lazy. I didn't do anything. You know what Jesus Christ said to that last servant? Thou wicked and slothful servant. God expects us to multiply His resources. How? Making a sound investment. Making a sound investment. Give them back to the Lord. Give them right back to God through tithes, through missions and offering into the work of God. Somebody said, The only investment I ever made which has, which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I have given to the Lord. That's from J.L. Kraft, the president and the founder of the Kraft Cheese Corporation. Uh, does that ring a bell? Do you make mac and cheese? My son's favorite is mac and cheese. <laughs> so remember, whenever you, you, you make that Kraft, you, you know, mac and cheese, remember what he said, the only investment I ever made which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I have given to the Lord. Making a sound investment. But secondly, how are we going to increase what God has given us? By not being wasteful or simply by saving. Okay? Sound investment and by saving. Do you really need that extra cup of coffee? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, I need that kind of cup of coffee. <laughs> I understand. I know, if, especially if you're not a morning person, I need to be awake. 
But do you really need to spend that kind of money? Do you really need to go to a, to a you know, what, high, you know, high kind of stores instead of going to a thrift store? I know. Yeah, consignment. Do you really need to have, you know, the branded clothes instead of using the regular ones? Savings. My son. Okay, I'm not telling who. <laughs> he worked four to six months, and at the end of the day said, <laughs> where did my money go? Yeah, he earned decent uh, kind of, uh, you know, decent job and earned decent living. And so he decided to account where his money went, you know, for the last three months. So he took his debit, debit uh, report, I mean, the monthly report, and took it out and then categorized all the expenses where his money went, Okay. Where did it go? And so he, he started, you know, from this month and this month, and three months averaged it. You know where money go? Number one there, top of the list, is eating out in <laughs> restaurants. <laughs> Secondly is gifts and shopping. See? Well, you know, praise the Lord. Uh, he was investing in the work of the Lord. He was giving the work of the Lord, but he failed on the second one, on the savings. You see? He was working, he's giving to the Lord, he's, he's tithing, he's giving it to the Lord, but he failed on the second test of savings. You know, praise the Lord, he's staying with us. He's not renting his apartment. <laughs> Otherwise, he will go in debt. Sound investment. Save. You know, God saved you from sin, and some of the sins are habits. Habits of smoking, and habits of drinking, and habits of whatever books that are, are not godly, and you buy those books, you invest on this, you invest money on things that doesn't mean anything in the light of eternity. Folks, God has saved you from those. Those are your savings. You can use it for the Lord. Depositing the resources He has entrusted to us right back into His kingdom's work is a sure way to multiply what He has given to us, especially when they help people hear and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, there are only two things that will last for eternity in this world. The book, the Word of God, will last forever. And the other one that will last forever is souls of men will last forever. And if you invest your resources, your physical, financial money, invest it for the salvation of souls, they would last for all eternity. I praise the Lord for those people who invested their lives in me. 40, 50, 60 years ago, some churches down there in Texas invested their life to a missionary. That missionary went to our place. They supported that missionary until he died in our place. I was one of the fruit of the missionary. And I was one of the fruit of those people in Texas. They've never met me. But well, I'm going to see them someday. Praise the Lord for them. Thank you so much for investing your life in missions. Thank you so much for giving for the Lord. That I could be here, that I'm saved. Hey, praise the Lord. There are some people who invested in your life that now you're saved. Praise the Lord. Amen. Invest your life and save. Okay? Don't waste it. The number two, we see here that the purpose of a steward, we are not the owners, but we are the stewards. We should multiply the owner's resources. And then secondly, the parable of a steward. What's the parable of the steward here? In the book of Luke, Luke chapter 16, in our uh, text, Luke chapter 16 Verse 1 to 8, let me just read it to you. Let's go there, please. And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. Verse 2, And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest not be no longer a steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? 
For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg. I am ashamed. I am also resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called everyone to his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and write four score. And, he, and the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in the generation wiser than the children of the light. Folks, we see here, that the parable illustrates the steward's responsibility. Letter A in your outline, the, the parable illustrates the steward's responsibility. We do have a responsibility as a steward of God. We are given that responsibility. The ineffective servant and his upcoming report to the master should remind us of our responsibility. You see, the parable was given here. The, the master said, give a report of your stewardship. Someday, we're giving, going to give an account of what we have done as Christians, as believers in the Lord. We are going to give an account. Can you imagine standing on that day, looking at the scarred thorn, scarred face of our Savior, looking at his nail pierced hand, and looking at his nail-pierced feet, staring there in front of Jesus and saying, Sorry, Lord, I've been so slothful. I've been so lazy. I'm so selfish. I did not do anything of the talents you've given me. Could you imagine standing before God someday like that? Wow. Wow. And all our excuses now, all our excuses of not giving, of all the excuses of, well, I'm offended, well, I don't want, all those excuses will pale in comparison to what you're going to face up with, with God, in total shame. Just because we've been selfish. Just because we fail to manage the resources God has given us. It illustrates a responsibility. We do have a responsibility. First Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible says, Now if any man build upon the foundation gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for that day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. As stewards, we have responsibilities to give. Consider the following givers. Consider these following people. Givers, what they said about giving to the work of the Lord. They gave their time, their talents, their treasures themselves. Consider what they said. Oswald Chambers said, With Christ, it is not how much we give, but what we do not give that is the real test. The real test is not really how much we give, but how much we keep. F.B. Mayer said, he's the richest man in the esteem of the world who has gotten the most. He is the richest man in the esteem of heaven who has given the most. Amy Carmichael said, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. So if you love the Lord, you cannot say you love the Lord without giving. Winston Churchill said, we make a living what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Carl Meninger said, generous people are rarely mentally ill. And then somebody said, the happiest people on earth are the people who have discovered the joy of giving. And if you haven't observed that one yet, go to the nursery class. The most unhappiest kid there are the people who says, mine, it's mine, it's mine too. Those are the happiest kids. I don't know. I'm just making fun of your kids. But that really <laughs> you know, it reflects our ways as an adult, you know? Uh, folks, I'm just show, sharing it to you that the happiest people are those people who have realized the joy of giving. This parable illustrates the steward's reward also. Notice, the steward who was functioning irresponsibly changed his mind. 
at one point in the parable, the steward said, Oh no, my master is going to take away my stewardship. I have to do something. And folks, we have to realize that God is giving us second chances. Folks, in essence, God doesn't re really need our money because everything belongs to Him. He's just giving us a chance to approve Him so that He could bless us. You see, this parable illustrates the steward's reward. The reward is this. The Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. And he keeps the record on a daily basis. He knows who's giving. He knows, uh, you know, you gave something for the Lord. He knows that. And he's going to come and reward you properly. Rewards for, uh, rewards for good stewardship is not a poor, mo a poor motive for giving. Now, some people, they would say, well, you know what? If you're giving only just to receive a reward, you have a very low motive. Not really. If you give expecting a reward from your Heavenly Father, that's a good motive. Otherwise, he did not write these verses. He listened to these verses. Give, and it shall be given unto you. A good measure, and pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall man give unto your bosom. For with, with the same measure that ye meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, 22, verse 12, he said, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. See, Jesus Christ said, I have the rewards with me. I know you've been working. I know you sacrificed your life. I know you died for me. You died as a martyr. I know I have my rewards with me. Folks, if your motivation to serve God is for rewards, that's a good motive. Although we should serve God because we love Him, that's a, that's a greater motive. But folks, serving God, giving to God, to be rewarded of Him is not a bad motive. This parable also illustrates that we will be given a reward. And then number, number three on your outline there, the principles of steward. We have studied the purpose of a steward. What's the purpose? We are, uh, we are not the owner. We have to manage the resources. We have to steward or to multiply God's, uh, God's resources. And then we studied the parable of the steward there in the book of Luke. The parable illustrates the steward's responsibility. And we do have also rewards at the end of the day. But thirdly and lastly, the principles for a steward. What are the principles here? There are four principles that God has given us in this particular book. God closes his story with some principles that we can learn. Number one, the principles of proprietorship. The principles of proprietorship. What is this? Proprietor is someone who holds property as a landlord or shopkeeper. You're a shopkeeper. You, own, uh, you don't own the shop, but you keep it for somebody. You know, somebody is is owning that shop, uh, like some of you are. Uh, you go to work, you don't own the company, but you work for them. Uh, a proprietor is kind of like higher than that, uh, the boss of uh, the company, but he doesn't own the company. Luke chapter 16, verse 10, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. We are proprietors who manage God's property, and we are on probation. You see, and he is finding out how trustworthy we are so he could be able to entrust to us the true riches. If he can trust us with his money, if he can trust us with the resources, the time, talents, and treasures that we have. By the way, we're not only talking here about money. We're talking about time, talents, and treasures that God has given to you. If God can entrust you those things, imagine what other amazing things he could entrust you with. Imagine that, you see. And then secondly, the principle of ownership. We've touched base on that a while ago, but let me just go through it. Anyways, the principle of ownership. Notice verse 12. And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? If you're not faithful of what God entrusted to you, how can God entrust you your own things? Okay, an example here. You are, pretend you are a, an owner, a CEO of a company. Brother Jeps, let's pretend that you are the boss, the big boss. You own that company, and you're looking for an accountant, okay? So, say for example, you're here, and you're advertising, hey, I need an accountant who passed the CPA board exam, and uh, who is very good on accounting, and has so many years of experience. And somebody comes to you, and you read uh, his resume, and all of a sudden, you come to one point, it says, uh, 
He's filed bankruptcy. He's filed bankruptcy. Okay. My question to you, Brother Jeffs, which chances are would you hire that person? No. Because it will remind you know, how, you know, if this guy could not take care of his own personal finances and file bankruptcy, how can I trust him, my multi million dollar company, to him as an accountant? Randy Alcorn, in his book, he wrote this. His book, The Treasure Principles, explained that one of the greatest roadblocks to giving for Christians is the illusion that earth is our home. That's one of the roadblocks why Christians cannot give, is that we're thinking this is our home. We're thinking that earth is our home. If you live here in Canada and you go vacation in Egypt, or you go vacation in Europe, or you go vacation in the Philippines, wherever you go for a vacation, would you buy expensive floor decors or, or, or half uh, uh, decors or very expensive uh, couches or very expensive whatever house effects while you're on vacation? Chances are you're not. Why? Because that's not your home. You're not going to buy Lamborghini when you go to the Philippines or when you go to Europe because your home is not there. It's here in Canada. The same thing with believers. You know, the, the illusion that we think home is, earth is our home. Listen to this. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Listen to verse 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Do not take this in the reverse. Some of us are saying, for where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. No, 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 no. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The principle of ownership. When it comes to finances, some Christians think or believe they have the right for more. If you're not faithful in your, if, if you're not faithful in your tens, how could God trust you of your hundreds? Um, we think that we can spec or we can manage six digits figures, but you cannot be trusted with your thousands. The principle of ownership, we do take care of the things that we own rather than the things that we rent, isn't it? How many among us here bought a new or newer car? Would you raise your hand? New or newer car in your lifetime? Praise the Lord. Thank you for your honesty. Some people are raising their hands. Praise the Lord. Newer car. No, new, newer car. It doesn't matter if it's new. As long as it's your own car, you bought a new car. Amen. Thank you for honesty. You know, when you, the first day you, bought, you brought home that car, you said to your kids, or you said to your, you know, to whoever, your loved ones, don't bring any food in the car. No food in the car. Right? I was like that. I said to my kids, no, don't bring any food in here. But right now, you know, five years later, they just bring it in. <laughs> but the first days, you know, I take care of it. I wash it, you know, prime it up and, you know, make it shiny. Uh, make sure it's in a good condition. But, you know, when we went for vacation and rented a car, it wasn't the same thing. I said, like, you know, okay, let's go, let's drive, and you speed up. You, you take less if it doesn't belong to you. You know what God says? The principle of ownership, treat it as your own. Because if God cannot entrust you of his own, how much more can he trust you with your own? That's what he says here. And then the principle of citizenship, I went, uh, I went ahead of myself here. The principle of citizenship. This world is not our home. We should make investment for eternity and not for this world. You see, if you make investment for this world alone, 
it will pass away, you will die, the, your riches will stay here, but when you make an investment for souls, for eternity, it will go forever. So we have the principles of proprietorship, the principle of ownership, the principle of citizenship. Ownership, you consider it as your own. Prove that you take care of what God belongs to Him. When my kids were growing up, and they're still growing up, uh, I bought my son, I'm not telling who this time, okay? I bought my son um, quite expensive, um, uh, what do you call that? Remote-controlled helicopter. One of those things, you know? Uh, they're pointing at each other now. <laughs> I bought them this gift. I, I, I can't remember if it's a birthday or a special day. I bought them this. And uh, they were so excited, playing around, okay? Unfortunately, it flew only once. Okay? And, you know, these helicopters, you, you, when it hits the ceiling, it drops, it gets broken, right? Well, as a father... And uh, uh, looking back at it, and you could relate to this, would you buy them a second one? <laughs> maybe, right? Maybe. But I thought at that time, maybe they're not ready yet, or maybe they played in the wrong spot, or, you know. That's the same thing with God. God entrusts us something, and we waste it, and we don't take care of it. I'm not saying that these boys are, are bad. It's just that, you know, uh, the remote-controlled helicopter doesn't stand the way they play So at that time. So, uh, folks, the principle of ownership is there, the principle of citizenship. And then lastly, this is what I want to point out, the principle of relationship. What do we get from this? All of this is basically the principle of relationship. God really points out that the heart of the matter here is all about loving and serving God. Luke 16, verse 13, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So essentially, at the end of the day, it's a principle of relationship. God is saying, would you trust me, my child? Would you trust me? And some of us, it's either we trust our human instincts rather than trusting God. Some Christians chose mammon, though. Unfortunately, they do choose mammon. Book of First Timothy, chapter six, verse ten says, "For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows." Some people, unfortunately, they choose the mammon. But some Christians, praise the Lord, choose to say, "God, I love you. God, I choose to serve you. God, I choose your will." Your will be done. Remember, there are only two schools of thoughts. In conclusion, let me gather your thoughts again. I know you're wondering, you're hungry. Well, let me close with this. There are only two schools of thoughts that you can choose from. Number one, God's way or man's way. God's way of handling finances or your own way of handling finances. Will you today uh, trust God enough to do what he says with what he has given you? Will you trust them and say, Lord, I am, a, I am just a manager. You are the owner. You realize that I have to manage the resources you've given to me. Be a faithful, trustworthy steward. Remind yourself that you are not the owner, but rather a humble steward of God's resources. Your cup will soon be running over with all the good things that your master has in store for you. Start giving what you have. Don't wait for the day, oh, preacher, you know what? I'm going to give when, uh, when I become rich. When I'm earning this, I'm going to give. Uh, when I graduate from high school, when I graduate from this, when, I, when the kids are away from our household and we're free, I can give. No, don't wait for that time. Many people believe that they would be more generous if they had more money. But according to Forbes, there were 946 billionaires in 2007. And they gave an average of 1.2% of their wealth. Just 1.2%. 946 billionaires, yet they only gave 
1.2% of, you, know, you might say, well, 1.2% is 100,000. Yeah, that's great money. But folks, God is not looking on how much. God is lo- looking on the percentage. How much did you keep? Would you rather trust God and say, Lord, I give it up. It's yours. It's yours anyway. God saved you. He's looking for a relationship. That relationship is, would you trust me, my son? Would you trust me, my daughter, with your finances? It's all worth it when one soul gets saved. Amen. Let's all stand, please. Let me ask the pianist.